my name is Kevin Trung. Uh, I am with Unity Technologies, and I will be kicking off this session as the moderator. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining our session on uh, XR in the classroom. Uh, and I want to start off by allowing our panelists today to introduce themselves. And uh, we'll start with Josh. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Josh Reibel. I'm the CEO of Dreamscape Learn. Some of you may have seen uh, the work we're demoing down in the marketplace. If you haven't, I hope you will. And that's me. Hi, my name is Corey Wynn. I'm the head of Emerging Technologies at Texas State University. And I deal with uh, XR, AI, and blockchain. Hey, everybody. I'm Anarupa. I'm the founder and CEO of Prisms VR. And we're a spatial learning platform for kids to learn core math and science by embodying themselves in real world problems. Also, founder and CEO of Reframe XR, probably the newbie up here, uh, building classroom management tools for spatial computing in the classroom. Thank you. And uh, my first question is to the full panel. Um, how is XR being used to transform learning in the classroom? And if you could all share one example of that, that'd be great. Sure. <laughs> um, so uh, PRISMS is really fun because it's taken a very passive um, educational experience in mathematics where the student's job is to read problems, to um, memorize procedures. It's, it's, it's a lot of like uh, learning via text and learning through modes of, of like audio and, 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 and words. And flipping that on its head and saying that your job is actually to experience things and to fall in love with problems. And then as you fall in love and embody and have these first person experiences, then moving from there and say, well, what sort of, what do I need to learn to solve this problem? And learning mathematics and science through the framework of the problem versus what we typically do today, which is let's first learn the math and science and then go and apply it. So I would say the most transformative thing I've been seeing in classrooms is flipping the entire instructional model, where now Z is A and A is Z, and you're starting with the first person experience in the world and then abstracting up versus um, the opposite way. Yeah, so actually I'll, I'll piggyback on that because I think that's the way in which our work is very similar. We also see it as a kind of inversion of the flow start with the problem, then learn the math and science that's needed to solve the problem. I think the thing that we're doing that is, uh, I think, both peculiar and interesting is our, our founder comes from the world of um, Hollywood cinema. And so a lot of our, the way we contextualize the problems is in, um, while it's immersive in 3D, in many ways is as much a movie as it is uh, curriculum. So we're big believers in the power of story and in uh, putting students in a position where they are the protagonist of an emotionally compelling narrative. And so when it comes time to learn the hard stuff, they're learning it because they're part of something that is larger than them, that they believe in, that they care about, in the same way that people can't wait to see the next episode of a Netflix series that they're binge watching. We're trying to create the same kind of momentum uh, in curriculum structures by using very cinematic Hollywood storytelling. Yeah, so uh, there's a lot of applications, and my job is finding them throughout the entire university. Uh, this impacts science, engineering. Obviously, you guys can imagine what uh, we can do there with you know computational dynamics, overlay stuff like that. Uh, from sociology, social work, humanities. So this is pervasive throughout. Uh, I think. One of the most powerful uh, moving things for an educator like myself and projects we involve in are immersive storytelling, especially for first generation students, uh, people of uh, color, uh, veteran students uh, going through PTSD. How does this help you know, immerse their stories uh, you know, so they don't feel so isolated and share their story around? Uh, a lot of them do not feel like they have a story that's worth telling. So it is our job to empower them and using technology where they're at. So it's an amazing time to, uh, to elevate the stories of our students. I think what I'll add is <clears throat> where we're focused on is, I'll, I'll just use the term shared spatial computing, but we'll, we'll also use mixed reality. And having shared learning kind of be the state in which you start. Um, and it really comes from my background as an English as a second language teacher for 10 years, where I always taught my kids and I taught teachers 
that a student's best resource is another student in a classroom. And so I think we're getting to a point where we have different modalities in and out of a headset that can create different options for that, and teachers get that choice. Um, and I'm like, I'm just really excited to see kind of the full spectrum of XR be a thing now, um, where we can actually use specific mediums for very specific points and be more targeted with each medium to create an outcome. Thank you. And I have uh, some questions for each of the panelists as well, uh, starting with Josh. Uh, what are some of your favorite examples of how students are learning through Dreamscape Learn? And how is immersive technology reducing limitations uh, for learning complex uh, subjects like biology? Yeah, so our, our flagship product, um, some of you have probably um, heard a little bit about this, was a replacement for, is a replacement for introductory biology labs, um, both at the undergraduate level and at the high school level. And the, in some ways, the most exciting thing is the part that's happening away from the VR. So the, the way that whole course goes is um, it's a series of modules where students are sent off into what we call an alien zoo. It's, it's, the conceit is that sometime in the future there is a space-based sanctuary for the endangered species of the galaxy. And it's a very rich ecosystem. They go out and they discover lots of problems, failing creatures that are dying, ecosystems that are collapsing, and through a series of missions have to figure out um, what's causing these problems and then analyze them and figure out how to solve them. Um, but the reason I said the most exciting thing is the part that's happening away from the VR is that it's turning out that the 15 minutes that they spend in VR encountering that problem is leading to three hours of work in a traditional classroom where students are, well, I guess the way I would put it is it's always sort of thrilling for us when we see the headsets come off and everybody's excited. It's more thrilling when we go to the classroom lab and you see four students huddled around an Excel spreadsheet arguing with each other about whether they've modeled the data right or not because they really care, because they want to save the creatures that are dying of cancer that they encountered when they went out in the alien zoo. And I think, like, one thing that's, I think, common in, in everything that all four of us do is um, that we don't see the medium as one that takes over school. It's one that it becomes sort of a part of an exchange between immersive experiences, traditional experiences, other modes of learning, that's just empowering um, and, and making more effective the, all those other modalities. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Uh, and Koi, uh, as a faculty member and head of emerging technologies at Texas State University, uh, why did you choose to develop curriculum on XR education uh, rather than like other technologies? I think the power of presence is very important, uh, a narrative, a story. Uh, it's important to give our students projects which they can do that they're proud of. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, even though we do a lot of science and stuff, uh, we also do a lot of uh, social studies and, uh, projects. So I developed a machine learning application uh, to be able to read weathered headstones through the phone. We're applying this to the veteran cemeteries across Texas to give context to those who have laid the foundations for our rights. So this is a collaboration between the history department, sociology department, Hispanic studies, because uh, Texas is a Hispanic serving institution. Collecting the stories uh, using UI UX, using augmented reality, you know, uh, to bring these stories to life, to have context to uh, the graves. So when you have this cross-pollination, Right? And you use technology where it is meaningful to use technology. So it's not a forced marriage. You know, AI is needed for this, right? XR is needed for this to bring out the context, right? When it's not a forced marriage, it will work and the students will get it. And, and if it's cross collaboration and they feel like they're contributing to society, which they are, right? But memorializing the stories uh, of people who are um, before them. It, it brings the community together. And so we even have social work to come in to help guide students through stories that might be traumatic, for stories that might trigger. So, you know, it's a collaboration, but if we do good work, you know, the students will definitely appreciate it. So it's very project-oriented. Yeah, thank you for sharing. And uh, Anurupa, um, your work at Presence VR is revolutionizing how students learn math and science. Uh, could you share with us some of the learning outcomes as a result of uh, VR math education, where are you seeing some of the biggest areas of improvements? Yeah, and I really want to piggyback off of, off of both of what you said is that 
it's astonishing um, how little time kids are actually spending in headset in terms of the ROI uh, on discourse and what they're doing thereafter. Students are getting these really high impact 20 to 30 minute experiences where they get to go experience a problem in the first person. Like you all said, they get connected to it, they're bought in, they believe in it, they want to solve it. And then when they come out, all those packets and paper pencil and the things that took us forever as teachers to try to get kids to do, they're doing it really quickly, again, because there is intrinsic motivation. So I just really want to double stamp that. I think that that's something that we're all seeing across the board. Um, in just terms of impact, uh, you know, math education has been in a crisis well before COVID. Right now, we have about 70% of US eighth graders that are not, that are not proficient, which is uh, devastating for Algebra 1. And as you all know, Algebra 1 is one of the, it, it's the predictor of future life wages. So the US K-12 systems across the US are right now kind of maniacally trying to figure out how do we solve our middle school math and Algebra 1 problem. But we're trying to solve the achievement problem before we solve the engagement problem. So we jumped to trying to get test scores up before solving the, the engagement of children wanting to be there, children believing that their education education has utility, that it has purpose, and if they show up to school every day, they're going to be able to go get a job where, like you were saying, they're contributive to the society around them. And so I think what I'll, I would all say is, yes, we've done an RCT that shows double-digit growth outcomes on test scores, and all of that is wonderful, but if I, would, if I were to really distill the beauty and the magic of what I'm seeing, um, it's, it's summarized in, in something that happened in Philadelphia two weeks ago. There was an earthquake there, um, and uh, all the kids, like they had to, it was like a, kind of a, 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 a big moment for, that, for them. And our absolute value functions module in Algebra 1 is where they travel to Kyoto in, in Japan, and they look at, um, they're trying to retrofit all the buildings to make sure that uh, any future earthquake of magnitude X, um, all the buildings can withstand that. And guess what? When, at, when, they, when they got in to do that absolute value functions module, there was so much camaraderie and community because they felt like they were actually solving a problem that they had just gone through themselves. And the kids walked out and they were like giving us hugs saying like, thank you for making school a place where I feel like I can come in and actually build things versus submit worksheets and submit equations on, on a screen. So we're seeing the, the double digit numbers, but I think the, the biggest value to the public and to society is our children loving being in school again. I just want to emphasize that's it. 100% right. That, like, I've been coming to ASU GSV for, since the beginning, 15, 20 years, whatever it's been. I've been in ed tech for 30 years, 35 years. Um, and the amount of time, energy, money, brain damage that has been spent on things that matter, but are, should fractions come before decimals or decimals come before fractions? Is it whole language or is it, is it phonics? And right. so little time spent on just find a way to get the kids to care. We all learn all kinds of things in our lives, despite horrible pedagogy and difficulty finding the information, be because we want to and we care and we're invested. And I think one of the things we're all learning about this medium is it has an amazing power to get people to lean forward and, 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 and want to do things. And once we've got their attention, we can kind of get them across the line almost no matter how good or bad the pedagogy is. And um, so anyway, I 100% yeah. agree. And I'm so sorry. There's like one thing that you made me think of when you were talking, which is that what, what did that do? It was destructive to the profession of teaching, right? So teachers right now with this new medium, they feel inspired again. They've always wanted to teach using real world problems and getting kids excited about the world. That's how they, that's why they want, got into the field. But then to your point, they, they were stuck doing progression analysis of what the, whether unit rate comes before uh, equivalent ratios. And, and, and that were, that's where the preponderance of their intellectual energies go to. And they're not thinking about how do we make kids value their, t their 50 minutes they have with us? How do we make sure that they, the real estate value of that is high? So it, it's not only was it d destructive to teach uh, kids, but it was destructive to teachers and their love of their own profession. And, and just one last um, <laughs> comment on this point that I promise we'll let it go. The other thing is schools, as we've all known them, and way before we knew them, have been weirdly destinations where people come, students come, whether it's college or it's K-12, to be sort of sealed off from the world that they're supposed to be learning about. The classrooms are these kind of hermetically sealed environments and all the stuff is out there. Um, and I think one of the things that this medium is creating in terms of possibilities for what schools can become is more departure hubs. So it's a place that you come not as the destination, but as the place from which you journey off to really anything you can imagine. If we want to hold class on a beautifully rendered perfectly rendered version of the Martian surface, we can do that. If we want to go to the Great Barrier Reef to see the way that the coral is bleaching, we can take you there. And if we can scale you down to be inside of a molecule, we can. So the, the whole possibility for what a school can be is changing. 
and it's not that surprising that once school is no longer just sitting in rows of desks, people come alive and want to do it. Ms. Frizzle lives. Yeah, all really great points. And um, uh, Jonathan, uh, collaboration and interaction are important components of effective learning. Um, how do XR platforms facilitate collaboration among students and what strategies do you deploy to foster meaningful interaction in virtual environments? Well, first, we don't create content. <laughs> we create the teacher platform that enables that. And it comes from both giving the teacher the ability to design their room in a headset spatially. The teacher's been designing rooms spatially, I don't know, for millennia, thinking about where things should physically be, how kids should interact, where should they stand, where should they sit, what should they do, how do I want to pace, how do I want to move kids around? What's been interesting with us is, again, thinking through the next medium piece, which is if they have pass-through and it's powered where they can both interact with objects at the same time or interact with their own manipulative at the same time and facilitate those conversations, then it really opens up kind of what you just said at the end, Josh, is we've seen kids in classrooms where um, they're no longer just sitting doing uh, something in a headset, they're getting up and moving around, um, and moving around the room all in real time as if I had controlled chaos with a, a Chromebook, and I walked up and just went over to another kid and started working with them. And I think that's, that's the barrier that we're trying to break down, and I think that is where kind of the final piece is, where whether they escape somewhere or whether they're brought back they have the ability to be with another student or a group of students in the learning that they're doing. And again, going back to the ability to wade in and out of these mediums is just, it's gonna be, it's just gonna be awesome. I just well, like inherent in what you're also talking about is this idea of like uh, real uh, use of modality, right? So you, what you talked about movement, so organized kinesthetic movements. Uh, we're talking about emotional resonance. So perception and emotion. Uh, we're talking about you have haptics and sounds. So how do you create these really visceral connections with structure, pattern? Like I, I work predominantly in, ma in mathematics, and right. So we think about how do you create a multimodal association of rate of change, a multimodal association of a derivative. If we take it out of dy dx, what's another way to represent that thought but using all these different modalities? And so just like I, I imagine what you're seeing is teachers now getting all these other ways to represent and express thinking that they didn't have before. Well, I would argue they had, it's they didn't know how to express it in a headset. As a teacher, not as content, you guys have great content, right? It's had, as, as a teacher, how can I create more control to carve up content and ways to split up kids in different ways that we've been doing forever? Um, I think the other thing is content that hasn't even been explored yet around how do we, how do we distill down learning music production that costs thousands of dollars to go to rent a studio or to go to college of education to do, Things, things that are really expensive to do, we can distill into a classroom that haven't even been done yet. I mean, putting, putting a music production studio on a wall and having four of those in a room and having students be able to work together either by themselves but in pass-through or together learning about frequency graphs, learning about the entire production of a music studio on a classroom is, is just, it's wild to see and it just opens up possibilities. And then to escape to a studio and have the immersive experience where you want to be with three other people in a room in a physical room while being with them in a virtual room alone gives you the focus, the ability to focus. I think that's what's kind of unsaid too with using these different mediums is now VR can be more specifically tactful, not just for context setting, but also for creating some kind of focus if you have neurodiverse learners or you have multilinguals who need that extra space um, to quote unquote disappear if they need to do something or to bring others with them to do what they want to do with, with each other. Um. Thank you. And so we're hearing a lot about the possibilities with XR as a medium. Uh, I'm curious to hear from anyone from the panel, uh, what are some of the biggest pain points, challenges that you're hearing from educators in terms of uh, adoption and retention with XR uh, learning in the classroom? I think, uh, yeah, since I have kind of the pulse of a lot of the faculty at my school, um, a lot of it's access, right? A lot of the simulations, uh, if it's really heavy, has to be tethered to a pretty high-end GPU, uh, especially something like computational fluid dynamics, right? Which is, you know, not for everybody's cup of tea, but uh, uh, access to um, just simply uh, assets and how do you make these things, right? So, you know, if it's not prepackaged, how do we have access to create these environments? So. What we do at Texas State is we build an entire ecosystem for that, and we have the luxury and the funding from grants to do that. So that could be a huge challenge for a smaller institution. 
And so I recommend you know, leveraging your connections, uh, especially the academy, we're open source. Uh, leverage what we have and give you guys assets, you know, uh, stuff like that, and, and, and know how, like, asynchronous material on how to create this uh, kind of environments for your students uh, to have. So that's one advice you, uh, for you guys is just, you know, lean into places that do have resources, because, you know, sometimes it is expensive to do. I think the biggest challenge that uh, we've been seeing, we're across thousands and thousands of schools right now, um, Title rural, there isn't a type of district or student in the US that we don't serve. And the biggest thing I'm, I'm seeing is that this is a new way to teach. So if it's a new way to teach, we have to put in significant investment in teacher upskilling. Um, this is not a one year thing. So when I'm signing on with my districts, we're saying we're gonna, this is a change management operation for the, te for, for the next 10 years. We're going from the teacher going up and teaching a concept and then doing group work. And we're, we're now saying the kid is in a real world problem and a teacher's job is to ask high quality questions. Um, what is that Socratic method? Which t students are you focusing on? Going back to what Jonathan was saying, how are you grouping your students? Um, had, kids then take the headsets off. How do you convert? Assessments are still paper pencil whether we like it or not. So, the idea of transfer. They've learned something in VR, and I want to believe they've learned it. You take the headset off, how do you articulate it? How do you communicate it? How do you write it down? How do you justify it? When you're going back into headsets. So this is just a whole new way of teaching, and this idea where K-12 has become so productized. Like, let me buy your product for a year, especially this, like, these like SaaS models. So it's not about buying a product for a year. It's about investing in changing how teachers teach and, th and therefore how, how students learn. And that requires superintendents being in seats for a long time. That, re that requires um, school boards have maintaining a stability and really investing in change in people because tech can only do so much. Tech can actually change much. But what we're trying to do is change human uh, behaviors, and that takes time. I want, to, I want to add what you just said around. Um, I just blanked. I'm, just like, I'm sorry. I know. I had it. You meant something. Oh, oh. Um, how we do assessment. Yeah. So a lot, most of assessment is reading and writing. Um, and what's really great about being in a headset is it forces you typically to speak. And uh, language, learning language and how to speak it and speak it in different content areas and the technical language that you need to use for students to learn that technical uh, concepts or themes tends to have them speaking those. And I think that's a really unique um, point. There's a product called Keep Talking Nobody Explodes. It's an asynchronous game where someone's in a headset communicating with someone off headset that's looking at something different. And they're having to communicate what is happening to decipher how to, un how to not stop the bomb from exploding. And those asynchronous models, I think, are really important because they drive the language needed for students to communicate in very unique ways. And just talking about assessment models not being even close to what we end up doing in a headset. And I would say also, when we think about onboarding or even you know, just thinking about testing the product first, I would say if you're an administrator, put a teacher and a student in a headset first watch them, and then make a decision. Because I think we go back to engagement, and we go back to what's going to drive the outcomes and who's going to be in the headset, who's going to be using the headset in the classroom, get their decision making, and get their input. Because uh, I think you'll have a wildly different perspective watching students trial a pilot of a product versus you coming in potentially having very specific lived experiences that are different than kids now, where a lot of, kids in, or a lot of people in headsets are kids now. Well, like just one thing to like throw out to the panel, and we can we can come out of this question. But it, it's the thing I continue to struggle with, though, is this idea of transfer. That even if you've experienced something, have you learned? And are you actually able to post like six months later apply that concept? Because ultimately, that's what the education system is requiring: that they learned a linear function, they learned you know uh, the organelles of a cell, but then two, three, four, five months later, they're able to apply that to new context. I think that's what we're trying to really figure out: is what does transfer mean? out of the headset, how are we using the right formative assessments while they're in device, what are we doing once they come out, and what is that translation, and are we gonna to move to a world where assessments will be also become multimodal? In which case, you have an alignment between the accountability framework and the instructional model, whereas right now, we're trying to move instruction to spatial, and yet um, assessment is still very, very high cognitive demand with, with just words and symbolic text, especially in STEM. Yeah, and um my next question is, uh, uh, what are your uh, vision or uh, what is your prediction for the future 
of XR learning? Like, uh, if we come back to this conference in three to five years, what's something new that maybe is a limitation now that uh, XR will continue to improve on? I think there are sort of technical answers to that question, and then there are pedagogical aspects to that question. On the technical side, I think, look, the, the headsets are going to get lighter, more comfortable. You're going to be able to spend more time in these immersive environments without it becoming too much sort of sensory input and too much weight, and that, that will you know, change the way people think about what, what's worth doing, what's not doing. I think the assessment stuff will get, start to get figured out, and um, we'll start to think, begin to figure out more than we have so far what are the things we actually want students to be able to do now that um, doing things is, is a whole different set of activities from what it's been in the past. Um, my, personally, one of the things that I've been quite alarmed by, especially on the higher ed side for the last 10 years, is the amount of what I would call like excessive drive towards vocationalizing post-secondary education. That, um, obviously, I think we all believe that it's important that post-secondary education align well with career opportunity, but the sort of death spiral that the humanities are in right now, the, uh, the lack of interest in a full general liberal arts education, I think is really a tragedy. Um, and I think we're starting to see ways that this medium can really bring general education back to life. And um, uh, so it's certainly my hope and, um, and I think expectation that if it were 10 or 15 years out that people would have sort of rethought what does an undergraduate education really look like regardless of whether it's happening at a community college or at an R1 or a large state school or, or something in between. Um, and we're certainly working hard at that problem. I mean, I, I want it to be the case that any student who comes through an institution that's working with Dreamscape has a solid grounding in the fundamentals and the, the disciplinary fundamentals of quantitative stuff, scientific stuff, and humanistic stuff, and that they're just sort of blown away by um, how exciting it all can be because of the kinds of places we can take you to do the work. If I can say, I think uh, in the future, very close future, uh, generative AI, and no code is going to change the scene uh, around accessibility for educators. It will be a lot easier to have even students, undergraduate students or advanced high school students, to create these kind of learning modules also, right? So this technology that's coming uh, will help uh, a lot of entry, right? And also when this technology gets more widespread, it's easier for teachers to learn how to use it. There is a learning curve right now, but it's going to get less and less for everyone. Uh, so I, I think the future holds um, a very great promise uh, to make this technology very accessible uh, for creatives, uh, from teachers and students. And that's very exciting because ultimately, you know, we want you guys to be the authors of your own curriculum and story and what you feel is important to your students. So uh, hopefully uh, with generative AI coming, it will help. You will always need experts, right, in, the, uh, in this panel to guide sometimes, but you know, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll put that little bit of that power to you guys. So I think it's very exciting. Yeah, if I were to kind of close my eyes, I would say the future classroom, um, it's a real return to humanism in so far as um, right now, you have these like boxes, right, with your computer, your your paper, pencil, these like different modes that are very separate from each other, and they're quite separate from the human body because natural interfaces are just not a big part of how people sense make in the modern math classroom and science classroom. So um, I think uh, that what you were getting at, which is this like reality dial, where you can go between modes very seamlessly. So I'm in full VR when I need to be in Baltimore to help this water treatment plant neutralize all the chemically contaminated water in Baltimore. But then once I've learned that, I've, I've derived the, the relationship between um, acids and bases and the equations, I can come out and I can now use tactile manipulatives to continue to think through um, and continue my journey with, with, with learning, but not in Baltimore any longer. And then you know what, now I don't need those. Now I really need to sit and reflect and write. And that is just with my, my, my favorite Muji pen, right? So being able to go back and forth between these modes based on learning objective and what the, the, the objective of, of, um, of the classroom is. And I think the last thing I, I would say around my hope and my real aspiration for what this medium is gonna contribute to education is when, when a child comes home at night and you ask them what they, what, they did, what they learned, they're not saying I learned systems of equations. 
that that's bananas. Like, wh wh what utility is that? But the child says, hey, there was a massive thunderstorm in Chicago's O'Hare Airport, and I joined air traffic control to figure out how we're going to get all those flights safely off the runways. That's a learning. And so you're moving children's imagination of school, like, what are you doing? What, what are you learning? It's, I solved this problem. And it builds identity. It builds identity in the mathematical sciences that over and over and over again, if you kind of, if you learn how to build, that's what you're going to kind of continue to do when you, when you leave your, your education system versus I learned all this stuff. Now I have no idea what I want to, what I want to do with it. And you have very people very confused later in life about um, what they want to contribute to and what they want to build. This was 15 years is the question? Five, five years? Okay, five years is better. I was thought 15 years. Um, five years, you know, I think with Reframe, we're thinking about the 99.9% .9 of humans, so therefore a subset of humans is teachers who've never been in a class or never been in a headset and experienced VR. And so with five years out, I'd like to think five to 10% of teachers are actually, with generative AI, to an extent, speaking scenes and objects to life that they can manipulate and create those real world context settings, whether it is escaping to VR or being in the real world, um, but it is always and constantly led by the practitioner in the classroom. You guys said everything else. I'll just end on that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have a couple minutes left. Um, one of my last questions is, uh, uh, and then we have a lot of educators and educational leaders in the room. Uh, what advice would you give them on how to get started or, um, yeah, uh, if they're interested in uh, incorporating uh, immersive education? I, th I think it's good to uh, find models that you have out there from other places and seek advice from them uh, with a similar socioeconomic background maybe uh, of, of your institution. Uh, we don't have to everyone be like you know, Harvard or anything, but you know, just find something that uh, will help you in your situation. Uh, resources, uh, there's a lot of resources, like Meta has resources for educators on how to you know, use VR, uh, stuff like that. Uh, lean on other universities uh, for guidance. Um, there's a lot of people who are more than willing to help, myself in particular, uh, to guide you that way. There is a learning curve, be patient, like you ask your students, uh, but it's well worth it. Uh, I think it is uh, going to be here for a long time and uh, it's an exciting time, but you know, seek help and uh, guidance and uh, resources from your peers. The one thing I would say is um, really, uh, the tech is the tech, and I think I've maybe said this a few times now, but be pedagogy first. I think the last few generations of technology made the massive mistake of like cool factor and was like, oh, here's this new tech. Like, let's figure out what we can do with it versus, I don't know what we can do with it, but let's figure out what we want to do. And is there intersection between what we want to do and what, is, what, the, what this thing affords? And if there isn't inter intersection, put the tech aside. But right now what's happening is like a new technology is coming out and we're like, well, we have to use it, right? Because it's revolutionary. It's technocentric. Yeah, it's yeah. technocentric. Whereas I think like that's one of the biggest, I'm a founder, but I was a teacher. And I thought, thought about it from the perspective of what was I trying to do? What was the pedagogy I was trying to scale? And then use the technology to fuel and scale that pedagogy. I think that's the first thing I would say. And then the second thing I would say is you'll be shocked at how fast your kids go. So teachers who are a bit scared and reticent of like, I'm not an expert in the technology. Um, I have to know everything. No, you don't. Because the kids are going to get in there. They're digital natives. They're going to start flying through the UI and the headset. So you get to do what you do best, which is know your kids. You're an expert on your, on your kids. So the questioning, the feedback, the, uh, the just-in-time support, the, um, the discussion, the connection to the, to the math and science ideas, like your job doesn't change at all just because you now have this tech-enabled tech tool. You get to actually focus more on that because what, the, what, what something like VR, AR does is fully engage kids and make them real leaders. Um, and you don't have to worry about be, being the connoisseur because they're going to have that part focus on the, on the pedagogy, which I just don't think teachers have done in the past. They focus so much on the technology. I have to know this. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I have difficulty with the technology. Don't worry, they're gonna have it. Or let's just assign a couple tech helpers, they'll, they'll take it. And I think that, you know, it's just been incredible. We're across like the top 40 school districts right now. We're in hundreds and hundreds of districts across 37 states. There isn't a single type of teacher who has not been able to teach with Prisms VR. And that is such a happy moment for us. Um, 
that, that those barriers to adoption, they don't exist because the medium is just much, much more intuitive than, than its predecessors. Put a kid in the headset. When you, when you get to try prisms, put a kid in a headset first. Watch their reactions, then work your way up <laughs> instead of work your way down. And you will see how quick they are a fish to water in a headset. Yeah, we have a couple minutes left. Um, so uh, on the notion that you just brought up, uh, Anirupa, of like the cool new technology, uh, I'm curious. Uh, I won't uh, say it, know, don't worry. Yeah, yeah like. It's like a bad uh, word to me. Oh, no, no, it's okay, but I, I, I'll, I'll go there because we have the time. Um, uh, on generative oh, AI, no. like, uh, uh, like with the emergence of generative AI, like what are some of the trends or patterns or concerns you're seeing from teacher and how has that differed from like when immersive education first came up uh, in the classroom? Yeah, I, I think I, I might have the most unpopular view um, of, of this in, at the conference, but um, I just don't think AI is there in, so, in, in, in that um, learning is multimodal. Right now, most of the AI models, is, it's, it's very text heavy. Right, so it's like you input via text, you give via text, you uh, the 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 audio um, like beta is, is fine, uh, but right now like my predication is that you learn through movement, you learn through sound, you learn through all these rich ways of engagement, and it's not to say AI is not going to get there. I think actually, um, you know, I, I visited OpenAI very recently. I got to meet Sam Altman. They have a really really kind of audacious, ambitious vision ahead. But right now, if you look at what it's capable of, it's nowhere near what best practice pedagogy tells us around how people sense make um, and, and learn to kind of abstract and, and, and build knowledge. Having said that, I think what it's helping is content creation. So like I build content at like maybe a two to three X rate faster now because so much has been, has been automated and I think that that's gonna be the greatest value for AI in the time being is allowing us to create things faster. But in, in, but in terms of pedagogical value, questioning, tutoring, support to the child, I think we're, we're light years away. You can meet us at Contrarian Corner tonight at a bar near you. Um, I would completely agree. Uh, AI is entirely through a text chat box right now. And until it can look over the shoulder of a child, assess that child's well-being, their cultural background and upbringing, and know what question to ask in the moment, and then use that to bounce that off a student that's right next to them that could also be helping them in the moment. I just, I don't, I don't see it being a tool for learning, for productivity, even a teacher productivity. And mainly because AI can't reason as of yet. It's entirely derivative from existing knowledge base, and that's not what a teacher does. There's like a million data points that you are analyzing at any given point to, to make your next move, and most of them is not generated from what you've done before. It's in the moment innovation. So maybe two people are the most unliked people at this conference. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Josh and Coy, uh, just closing thoughts. Doesn't have to be about that question, but closing thoughts, yeah. Well, I guess I, I'd close by saying what part of what's, I think, really exciting about this medium is um, it's sort of inherent ability to close achievement gaps. And I know it seems weird to talk about a technology as having that kind of, um, kind of uh, propensity, but the, we all know that the students that come into school, whether it's K-12 or it's higher ed, well-prepared, believing in their own abilities, motivated, they find their way to uh, success one way or the other. And it's everybody else who doesn't. And uh, I think, you know, we've only been at this, we at Dreamscape have only been at this for a few years. And we've already seen in what is totally a high dropout gateway course, intro biology at, at the undergraduate level, I think nationally it's something like 48% DFW rate, um, DFW rates of 4%. And students in you know underrepresented male Pell eligible students who used to average 76 in their um, in their lab grades now averaging 94, um, and it's not because we've done anything that magical yet. I, I really think it's because when you contextualize the stuff in a way that um, is emotionally engaging, people can do the work, and when you don't, they uh, they can't. And um, so anyway, so th there's something about the ability to take people to places, embed them in narrative context, get them to think about school as a, a very different kind of experience from what it's been before that is helping a much broader range of students stick with it, persist, succeed, um, 
and I think most of us here, most of the 7,000 people that are at this conference probably care more about that achievement gap closing than just about anything else. And so um, I encourage people to really look into what is, what is special about, um, about these immersive technologies with respect to that mission. I guess my advice to you guys is try to experiment, right? Don't be married, don't have a forced marriage to technology, but don't be afraid of it, you know? Just experiment like your students. Experiment teaching, right? Teaching is hard. It requires some experimentation and it takes a little bit of time to get it right. But you will get it right. I mean, you are the professional, so experiment. Yeah, well, uh, with that, uh, please give our panelists a round of applause.